And that shift goes so fast, takes place so fast that the vast majority of non-Jewish Germans don't even notice that their whole normative universe is changing. Why is this so important for understanding the 30s and 40s and I think for understanding our situation today as professionals and leaders, it means that our ethical standards and what we think we're doing can shift, can change so that, and historians who've been looking into that have argued over the last couple of years that perhaps even the self-perception of Germans as being morally intact people as they did these crimes was crucial for that whole process. And to come to your question, that is for me a dire warning that also in 2011, sorry, also in 2021, that's where we are, I believe. Also in 2021. You began, you began the project in 2011. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> also in 2021, that is what, what I can be a part of and that it's important that professionals shoulder that responsibility. Let me ask you, um, uh, you mentioned clergymen and I'm intrigued um, by the question of positive and negative examples. Um, I studied with one of the great Protestant theologians, Paul Tillich. And Paul Tillich decided, uh, it was at the United States, was at Union Theological Seminary at that point, and was at Union Theological Seminary uh, together with Diedrich Bonhoeffer two of the greatest Protestant theologians of the 20th century, two Germans, one of whom decided to stay and one of whom decided to go back because he said in the words of Bonhoeffer that only someone who was there could create the German future. Now, Bonhoeffer presents an interesting case because he was a dissident his father was a dissident, one of the only two psychiatrists that we know of who refused to cooperate in the T4 program. His brother-in-law was a dissident uh, and his family were full participants in the dissidents. Do you present positive images of someone like a Bonhoeffer when you deal with clergy? We definitely study them. We study the leading figures of the confessing church. We look at uh, the bishops and archbishops like uh, Gall and, and others who were key on the Catholic side of things. Germany was, of course, roughly 60-40 at the time. Yeah, and von, Gall von Gallen, for everybody to know, was uh, um, uh, a Count uh, von Gallen, who also was a bishop who was the, a major Roman Catholic figure in denouncing the T4 program, uh, the, youth, the quotation marks euthanasia program. And um, uh, it was because of his pressure in part that it was driven underground and continued surreptitiously, but not directly. So Michael, that question is extremely important. We realize two things. We deeply believe that it's important to study the perpetrators, but to understand the perpetrators and to give some kind of profile and depth, you of course need the contrast to those who take different decisions. And that's of course where your positive negative tension comes from, right? So we need to see how, of course, talking about the church, you would have the split. Now, Galen is of course an interesting example because um, these Catholic priests uh, and or even bishops and eventually archbishops, of course, protested against the murder of disabled children and grown-ups, but only um, barely in any way reacted to the disenfranchisement, persecution and murder of German Jews. So, and that leads me to the second point. What we are really interested in are these complexities where it's not either yes or no, black and white, but where people are these complex figures. And that's, of course, the way that we try to bridge the gap between the quotidian challenges within these professions and the extreme evil uh, of where this whole process led to. Let me bring Yael into the conversation. Uh, Yael, um, I, gotta, I gotta get into a view where I can see your face. So let me get into a gallery view instead of speaker view. Yael, what drew you to this? Oh, um, I think many things drew me to it. One, I, I had an 
an interest in, in ethics. Um, and I was interested in, uh, I was a medical student and I had been a divinity school student and I was interested in ethics throughout. And I was, it, I was particularly drawn to a program that could, that situated each of these disciplinary ethics within a, within a larger professional ethics. That was the small piece. The big piece I think was that um, I, uh, I was very close in my childhood and young adulthood with my grandparents who were Holocaust survivors. And um, the reality of the Holocaust was never um, in question. It was never a project for me. And, and, um, and it came with, it kind of was married to an existential vulnerability, I think that we each find in our lives one way or another sooner or later. Uh, my apologies for the dog. Um, so, so that to me was kind of in the background. And I think that what really interested in me, interested me in the program was the challenge of identifying with perpetrators um, for the same, for the same end that I had always thought I identified or, or, not necessarily identified with, but empathized or um, felt some kind of intimacy with victims and survivors um, for, the, for the sake of, of distinguishing ourselves, for, of doing better, of learning from. Um, and so it, it inspired my sense of responsibility. Um, and it sounded like it would be a, a challenge like I would have to become a better professional and a better person in order to uh, meet the experience. Um, uh, let me ask you the same question I asked Thurston. What was the impact of place on setting the context for your yeah, learning? Yeah that's, that's exactly where it's what really what really made me committed to the to the program. Um, I think you know, in terms of thinking about the Holocaust as um, from the point of view of a survivor, I, I got that from the intimacy and reality of my grandparents um, and my embodied relationships with them. I think in the, the challenge of seeing yourself as potentially doing harm, um, whether you, and not from a place of hate, but from a place of professionalism, um, it's hard to do that purely abstractly. I think that it's an emotionally, spiritually, psychologically challenging exercise. And, and I think being in that place, seeing the, that these things happened in you know, beautiful buildings, office buildings, street corners, places where ordinary things happen, I think it's what makes the imaginative leap possible and not only possible but but deeply felt so that it's not just an imaginative imaginative game or exercise there's you feel just enough real peril and real urgency and real grief to to participate in a difficult transformation And let me ask one question before I, I turn back to Thurston, one more question. Have you had echoes of your experience in your personal medical practice at this moment? Um, all the time. <laughs> Sometimes, I mean, I, I tend to speak my mind um, and and but it, you know, from the ver from very serious or very grave moments to lighthearted moments. Um, I, not only do I think of FASB, but it, you know, gives me language to, to to invite my colleagues to expect more of themselves in ways that aren't threatening. Um, I think a lot, a lot of people don't know a lot about anesthesiology, but for but for example, it actually um, the ethics of of consent um, comes up every time I'm on call, and there are emergency surgeries, and we have to judge 
how emergent a surgery is in, in, in some degrees of urgency that you don't need consent, but it's still preferable if a person is able in a traumatic situation, to what extent is a person able to give consent or withhold let, consent? Let me, let me just interrupt for one second. Um, yes. I think we all should remember that uh, when the doctors were brought to trial at the subsequent Nuremberg trials, the judges established 10 principles of medical uh, ethics by which they judged the doctors. Mm -hmm. And the first principle was that uh, a patient is entitled to be informed of their treatment and to consent to it. Right. And the, one of the second, one of the other principles that was uh, enormously important was um, that the patient had the right to refuse treatment and to cease treatment at every point. So when uh, Yael is talking about informed consent and consent, I'm hearing all the echoes of Nuremberg and I want right. all of you to hear the echoes of Nuremberg as well. Go ahead, uh, Yael, I interrupted you. Oh, well, I, so I, no, it's, um, I was near, it, it's, a, it's an important interruption, thank you. Um, the, the gravity and the nuance of those of those consent processes come up every time every time I'm on call every time I'm at work also it might not be as complicated but there are there are nuanced situations frequently and I think part of my commitment to um, to being careful um, comes from my experience with FASB. I think a lot of a lot of physicians, it's easy to habitually believe that we are doing good and therefore any way, any door that we open to ourselves to do what we do is good. And, and I make a practice of asking my, of saying, well, maybe what I'm doing isn't good. I have to find, I have to make sure the path to doing what I'm doing is good also. Um, and there are many other examples. That's just- Thor Thorsten, let me ask you um, a, a question. How do you avoid uh, cheap uh, analogies? Um, and how, how, you know, um, how do you avoid not trivializing the Holocaust when you make analogies? And what do you teach um, your participants? I don't want, want to call them students because they're, high level professionals, what do you teach them about what is a responsible and irresponsible analogy? Because we see everybody calling everything, you know, the storm, storming of the Capitol was Kristallnacht and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody said that the um, um, uh, shutting down uh, Parler was Kristallnacht. Um, we're, we're throwing around the Holocaust as, as an enormous, uh, enormously misused analogy all over the place. What do you, what do you, what's the what is the discussion like? Extremely important point. We try to do two things at the same time to say that these things cannot be equated, um, but at the same time that historical references, historical context, historical analogies is extremely important. And we do it anyway, right? I mean, it's all around us. So the question is, how can we do it in a meaningful and careful way? So what we're trying to say is to equate things would do injustice to both, right? It would mean that you then would probably distort the contemporary issue that you're talking about. We probably don't understand more about the insurrection or the coup attempt of January 6th by these references and vice versa. There are probably many things of Nazi or Stalinist terror that we would banalize and simplify by having contemporary references. So we, we wouldn't understand either, either, but I'm enough of a historian that I deeply believe that it's through a historical analysis and historical understanding that I understand the contemporary situation that we're in better. So it sharpens my way of reading uh, the contemporary situation that we are in. And thinking historically, of course, also means thinking in choices thinking in options, thinking that um, the, the way Pat uh, kind of divides again and again. And if I may, I'll add one last point, And that is what we're trying to do is to encourage the fellows to think structurally. So it's not so much that A is the same as B, 
but much more that they are in situations that are very familiar. I'll give you, if I may, just a few examples. Please. The people that ended up building the crematoria in most of the extermination and death camps, the company, the engineers, the business people who ran it, and who also improved the ventilation system in the gas chamber. So I apologize for being so drastic here. As far as we can tell, did this job without being really convinced Nazis, anti-Semites, or being driven by other ideological motives, but much more out of being proud engineers, having some internal rivalry in their company and wanting to be close to power. Many of the evil outcomes that we see in Nazi well, Germany- well, let's, let's, also, let's also add, um, power was one of the seductive qualities, the other is money. Yes, but the irony with money, I mean, in general, definitely, but with tops and sons that I'm talking about, right. the money they made on the crematoria was never more than two to three of their total revenue. So the money didn't come from the crematoria, thinking as a company. And sure, it played a role for the engineers to some degree. Right? I'm, and, I'm, and by the way, and Tuff and company uh, on the crematoria put their names on it. Exactly. Because I mean, their, their name, if, if, you go, if you go to Auschwitz and you see the existing crematoria, uh, you see the name Tuff and Company. And okay. Tuff and Company in particular also protected one of their Jewish employees, which, which, gives, you, the which that gives you again that they probably didn't feel bad about what they were doing. They didn't walk around with pangs of conscience or big doubts in 1942 or 43. So to come to your question, it's the structure that we're interested in. I'll give you one other example. Very often, of course, there are cases where the question is um, people actually thinking they are choosing the lesser evil or they are preventing worse by staying in. Lösner was the example you brought earlier. And the problem is, of course, that that situation, as has been pointed out by David Luban and others, who's one of our faculty in that field of legal ethics in that context, is, of course, that that runs the risk that, as Hannah Arendt would say, choosing the lesser evil still means that you choose evil. And the question is always, do you end up normalizing both for yourself the bad stuff you do and also make it appear normal to your peers? So it might be legitimate to stay on, whether it's the Nazi regime or whether it's a government that does problematic things in 2020, or a company where you, you feel uneasy about uh, the fact that somewhere down the supply chain, they use child labor in, in Asia or are not responsible in terms of climate change and environmental factors. You might find yourself in a problematic context and, the, and you might tell yourself that you're in there to change things, but the question is, will the context change you? So those are the structural things that we can learn and study when we look at the Nazi context. We're asked a couple of questions. Um, uh, one of our participants, uh, one of our uh, people say, you know, wondering if science is participating in the program. Scientists were involved, she was uh, thinking about physicists, but scientists were involved all the way through. Yes, absolutely. Um, we are right now looking at adding a sixth program that would go in the direction of um, design, engineering, and also science. So the whole aspect of, uh, let's say, Werner von Braun, who, who designs uh, the rocket or is a key player in the rocket industry, or other scientists in um, in terms of nuclear armament of Nazi Germany, that's of course what would play in. We don't have a program right now for it, but it definitely would be something that would make yeah. sense. You, you may be too young to uh, remember, um, I studied math with a guy who was a satirist. And um, what he said of Werner Braun, von Braun um, is again, one of the very intriguing things. He said, we send up the rockets, but where they land is not my department, said Werner von Braun. And uh, that's Tom Lira, uh, who was a, a wonderful satirist of, of uh, the 1960s and uh, 70s. And again, the bifurcation. And Eichmann himself at his trial said, uh, look, I'm not responsible for the killing. I just put the people on the train. And once the train left, it was somebody else's 
problem at the other at the other end. What do you um, what do you do with um, diplomats? We actually 2020, 1920 was the year where we for the first time had a chance to actually work in that direction. And it started out with us um, ending up giving a, 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 the FASB annual FASB award posthumously to Fritz Bauer, that some of you will be familiar with perhaps, who as a German Jewish emigre came back to Nazi, Nazi Germany, uh, back to Germany after 45. Um, and uh, ended up being one of the key players in actually pushing for the legal prosecution of former Nazis uh, in the early. And there's also is also a person who embarrassed the Israelis Absolutely. to go to yes. to go after Eichmann and to capture Eichmann. So we had, uh, and that is that is he he made the judgment that if he he had found out the information about where Eichmann was, uh, and he essentially made the judgment that if he sent it around his department to go after Eichmann, it would leak back to Argentina, back to Eichmann. So he went to Israel, pressured the Israeli government, which had plenty of other problems and didn't want to go after Eichmann. So he was a, a very, very unique character and heavily involved with the Auschwitz trials in particular. Um, so I'm sorry to... I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt real quick, uh, Thorsten. Um, Lori, who is a uh, another graduate of your program through the journalism um, sect, she has to get going in a moment. And I just wanted to take, uh, if you don't mind introducing, she's also a TBA member. If you don't mind just introducing her real quick. Yes, please do. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, Thorsten. Oh, great to see you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lori Gutmann. I'm a Beth Tham member, and also I participated in FASB in 2012 um, as a journalism fellow. Um, so my experience with FASB, so I'm, I'm happy to kind of share my experience, which was absolutely incredible. Um, someone said that in the video when um, in the, the beginning of the call, but I also learned more about ethics and journalism in, in two weeks uh, than I did in two years of journalism school. Uh, so that's how powerful this uh, program was. Um, and so, yeah, it was incredible for so many reasons. But uh, first, I think it taught me to think about the Holocaust through a very different lens, um, the professional one. So I grew up in France as a, as a Jew. You know, you learn about the Holocaust through your grandparents, through at school. And, um, and you, you know, you learn about, you're not about it, you learn how it happened and who was to blame but you really hear about the role of everyday professionals, whether it's doctors, lawyers, or in my case, uh, journalists. And so I think FASB really taught me to kind of ask myself um, just tough questions. Um, what are um, the causes and more importantly, what are the, con the consequences of my reporting and what happens if I don't report something um, accurately and uh, what happens if I don't choose my sources carefully, if I don't report things the way they truly are, what are the consequences of my actions? And so I had, um, you know, there's one anecdote that kind of really struck me. Um, it was, and the question I, you know, I asked myself at the time is what happens if I put a source in danger? And so I was um, working on, on a documentary in Haiti um, and um, as time went on, when I was there, I realized that one of my main sources was, um, was in danger. Uh, it was badly um, uh, mistreated by the people he lived with. And so, of course, you know, I was there um, to report as a journalist, as a professional, but I also, I also wanted to help because, you know, you see someone who's, you know, who's in danger, you want to help. And, but one of the main questions is how, how do I do this without putting him in danger? Uh, because he was speaking to me um, anonymously. And so, uh, you know, this was, you know, big, it had really truly had a big impact on me. And this is just one example of, of so many things that FASB really helps you think about uh, the kind of ethics uh, or ethical questions that you kind of, um, have to ask yourself uh, in your career. And uh, you don't always have an answer. Um, and I certainly 
didn't have an answer at the time and I probably don't have one right now, but it just, it really, <clears throat> it really just makes you think and FASB really teaches you how to do that. Um, if, it, so, if, it weren't a, if it weren't a difficult dilemma and a difficult ethical dilemma, the answer would be easy. <laughs> most, of, most of us find that the, the, the great uh, issues force us to confront um, conflicting values, tensions between values, the impossibility of choice, etc. Absolutely. And, and Thorsten mentioned it earlier, you know, you, you really, you don't need to have an answer. And, and in most cases, um, you, you really don't, but you really, you're really forced to kind of um, just ask yourself the right questions or ask yourself questions. And well, so Lori, let me ask, let me ask you a question then. What for you was the importance of place? I'm sorry, say that again? What, what for you was the importance of place, namely studying this by seeing the actual places, most particularly by Auschwitz? What, what do you mean? I'm sorry, I don't... I'm sorry. You could have, you, you could have taken this in a course in, at, at journalism school. What was the importance of being in these places? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. I mean... <sighs> Obviously, you know, the, 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 I mean, it's impossible. You, it's, you don't even compare, but I think, you know, studying the past and, and being there and being, going to Auschwitz and, um, you know, to those concentration camps kind of helps you, you kind of leave, you leave those places with one goal and that goal is to just do better as professionals. So even though, you know, the, the, the experience you'll have in your career will certainly not be as as tragic as you know the Holocaust. You, I think it was it was important to go there because it really forces you to to do better. I don't know if that answers your questions, but no, that, that well, that, that's important. Let me um, let me ask um, uh, Thorsten and and Yael. Um, and especially, um, do you deal at all, not only with the experience of the perpetrator, but the experience of the victims? Um, and I, I'm thinking of, of two comments. Lawrence Langer, whom I introduced before, um, taught us that there were circumstances in the Holocaust in which the victims faced choiceless choices. And uh, that was structural. They couldn't choose between good and bad, not even between less good and less bad, but the impossible and, 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 and the horrific. And David Marwell, whom I introduced before, um, told us to approach J the Jewish situation by saying just because the victims were powerless does not mean that they were passive. And both of them have enormous insight into the nature of the victim's experience as well, even though David Marwell spent most of his, his book studying one character, the personification of a certain type of medical evil. I hope I'm not mischaracterizing you, David. Uh, yes, so I would say our main purpose as, as a, an educational program is to make sure that we um, bring the experience of the victims uh, to life also on in the context of the fellowships to make sure that we get an understanding that these are individuals with families, with life stories that are part of this so that we don't end up having a perpetrator perspective that turns the victims into sheer numbers and statistics because then something would be lost on us. Nevertheless, I always hesitate using the same kind of uh, categories and analysis that I would use for um, the perpetrators, whether they're Germans or coming from other European countries, because even if even when the victims had to take very difficult ethical choices, um, being in a concentration camp or in a different situation, the framework is a radically different one. Uh, and just to jump from the SS guard and his decisions to the, um, the camp inmate 
um, runs the risk of kind of uh, neglecting that huge kind of categorical uh, difference. And if I may, I would add one, one last point, and that is we also see ourselves a little bit as a program that wants to push back against dominant, uh, dominant strands in Holocaust commemoration and in Holocaust education. And um, a focus on the victims as legitimate and important as it is, of course, particularly when we want to think about the importance of the Shoah in a global and universal setting. I think the aspect of being um, complicit and being perpetrators is crucial. I mean, I know that there, I, I believe that you have a strong connection to the Holocaust, USHMM, to the Holocaust Museum in DC. And over the years that I've taught my history undergrads, what I always made them realize, the ones that had been there, was to say, think about what your visit to the Holocaust Museum in DC means when I taught American students. You go there and what do you encounter? You are entering the elevator, um, or having the ID card, you are invited to identify with one of the victims. Um, you will eventually go into one of the first exhibition rooms, at least back when I checked, and you will be put into uh, the situation of um, the liberators, right? Of, I believe, Eisenhower uh, liberating a camp. So the roles that you're put into are those of the victims, the li liberated, the liberators at the same time. But the aspect that is not touched on in that context is, of course, how easy can become can, can we become perpetrators? How easy can we become um, complicit? And that's, of course, where we put the focus. Well, that's a different discussion. I, I would say one of the things we do in Washington well is we show how government can be the perpetrator. Absolutely. Uh, in other words, uh, we would not have certain artifacts there and certain material there if we were not going to deal with government as the perpetrator. Um, and one of the issues that, that in telling the narrative is we want uh, the visitors, and you, you see it with, the, with your uh, participants, you don't want them to identify with the perpetrator you want them to have repugnance at what the perpetrator did and to learn from what the perpetrator did. Um, Yael, I, I, I'm gonna come back to you because um, I just finished refereeing a PhD dissertation on Warsaw Ghetto doctors. And I found um, uh, um, uh, the PhD dissertation was um, the student knew every leaf on every tree in the forest did not see a leaf, uh, did not see a tree and did not see the forest, but the information was vast. I learned uh, several things. Number one, I learned about the uh, way in which doctors uh, used the fact that ambulances brought patients to the Umschlagplatz to also come back and take people from the Umschlagplatz. Uh, and that is, and also there was a hospital adjacent to the Umschlagplatz that became a center of, refu uh, of, of um, rescue, but with all the difficulty of for everyone you rescued, you left somebody behind. Also learned something quite remarkable, which is that there was medical school in the Warsaw Ghetto because there were too few doctors. So they ran a medical school and a nursing school and a pharmacy school uh, to train people to do something in a situation in which there were, there were just not adequate facilities. And I kept thinking of its application to what you've seen in the hospital in the last months uh, as people had to develop resources and had to make very tough choices all the way through. Um, and that again is presuming the best of interest and the best of intentions of physicians. So I think there's, there's something to give people some positive models. And also what I liked about the dissertation is she really presented all of the difficulties as well. And the fact where the system itself um, compromises and forces compromise and forces uh, abdication all the way through. 
but there are very positive models of physicians that come from this uh, dissertation, which will soon get out in English um, with great with great difficulty because we have to bridge it to, in a certain way. Boston, uh, what what um, has been the pressure? in the last couple of years, given the rise of authoritarian governments and authoritarian leaders and the problematics of the fragility of democracy, what has changed in your student body as they deal with this? And uh, again, where would a medical student today or a, a, a physician be in a different situation than Yael was when she studied a decade ago? Yeah, what year were you there? I I was there in 2014. 14, so seven seven years ago. Let let Thorsten do it, and then you know, we'll ask you to respond to that. How do you think it might differ? I, one way that we've been trying to describe it is in many ways that we feel history or the, the contemporary situation for this has caught up with us. When FASB was founded a little bit more than a decade ago, some of these questions felt a little bit more theoretical, a little bit more sophisticated. In many ways, things have moved much closer. I think what really has broken um, increasingly over the last 10, 20 years is the confidence in the stability of democracy, the confidence that things will be more or less stable and just continue as they are. And not only in America, where I'm now been living also for the last one and a half years, um, but obviously also in Europe, we've seen um, very specific real examples of the fragility uh, of, uh, of, um, of democracy and also how kind of inhuman policies easily become, can become the standards. Journalists find themselves in the trenches being defined as the enemy of the people uh, and also many other areas. This has become even more crucial. And in the European context, of course, we can uh, see how the presence of um, Holocaust education and also a certain um, focus and perspective on the Holocaust in Germany, for example, has been questioned by the rise of right-wing extremist uh, parties like the AfD that question that narrative uh, as a part of the German education. So we can see how different versions, of course, um, that has become much more of a battleground in many ways. And that is what we're dealing with, whether it's the fellowships whether it's the study trips that we offer for people who already have been out of graduate school for a couple of decades, but still would be interested to go. We offer several study trips per year that follow the same pattern, the same structure. And also those are the themes that we try to touch on uh, in our webinars or with our training that we offer for organizations, for young diplomats that you mentioned earlier, for law firms, um, to have these kind of ethical leadership training that connects the contemporary with the histor historical. Now, uh, let me, um, Yael, um, let's ask you a question. Uh, what questions would you bring differently now to the discussion now that you've been a practicing physician for a while and not just a, a student? So I, not to escape the question, but I really, I think it's so well done, or it was, maybe it's deteriorated, but six years ago it, or seven years ago, it was so well done. Come on and have some confidence. It's only, got, it's only gotten better. It's only gotten better for sure. No, it was, it was absolutely a tongue in cheek comment. Um, I think one of the, and I think you actually, Torsten, um, I, I think this had been an idea, at least with one of the business faculty. I think one of the most difficult things in medicine, specific, in medicine is finding, finding your power without sacrificing it in a hierarchical, te rigid team structure. I think other professions have this as well, but definitely medicine has it. And, and, uh, you learn from the time you're, you're actually at the bottom of the power structure to kind of always feel like you're at the bottom of the power structure and to always be guarding your role um, because it's important and because you want it. Um, and, I, and we discussed the ways that that type of insecurity within a power structure can, 
can cause you to trick yourself into doing things or justify to yourself doing things that you otherwise wouldn't do, whether they're ultimately consequential and bad or inconsequential and good. Um, you might do things you wouldn't otherwise do. I think that the, the real challenge is learning how and practicing, like performatively practicing how to manage that position and that situation, um, not just knowing what you would do. That's, it's hard enough to know what you would do, but to know, to know that you can, when you can, and how you can, I think is something that takes practice. And I wish I, there are moments in my career, not when I think there were material consequences, but when I think there were um, intellectual or ethical kind of academic consequences to my not having spoken up because I hadn't figured it out yet. Well, um, I follow a very simple uh, premise, which is for an evening to be immortal, it doesn't have to be eternal. So we've gone on a little bit over time. So um, let me thank uh, you, Thorsten, thank for you. your continued work. Let me thank you, Yao, for sharing of your experience. And uh, let me thank you, Leah, for imagining uh, this evening. And let me thank uh, you all for attending. And I'll flip it back to Leah for a moment. Thank you, Michael. As always, thank you so much, Michael, for being an excellent moderator and bringing your expertise as well. And, and to Thorsten for your leadership with this excellent program. So absolutely necessary and the impact you're making in the world. And Yael, thank you for sharing your experience. Um, Thorsten, if somebody wants to um, look more into the program, uh, what is your website again? I'll put it, it's uh, fastb-ethics.org and perhaps I can find a way to put it into the chat. That's probably the most meaningful, let's see. Uh, what are the resilience, here we go. So it's even if you don't qualify for it, I highly encourage you to pass the word on to others to help continue to make an impact in the professional world. And, um, with and that, everybody qualifies. Perhaps if it's not for the fellowships, uh, we run, as I said, also all kinds of other programs, uh, both in terms of a corporate setting, law firms or also for study trips for people who already are 20 years out of grad school. Great. With that said, I know it's getting later on the East Coast. Um, thank you for staying up a little bit later than usual um, in terms of working. But uh, with that said, hope everybody has a good evening and um, a good night or hope you enjoy your dinner to the West Coast people. All right, thank you. have a thank good you. night. Thank you everybody. <laughs>